Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Monday morning. And we have Dr. Carol Moody speaking today. Before on your way out, our sponsors, please thank them. Our Bristol Myers Squibb, Bristol Myers Squibb, easy for me to say on Monday morning, and, um, and Pfizer. So please say thank you to them for sponsoring our session. And here's Dr. Sun to introduce Dr. Moody. Good morning. Most of you know Dr. Moody, but I'll give you a little background for those who don't. So Carol uh, did his uh, medical and undergraduate training in Poland and then came to the United States and completed his general surgery training in Philadelphia at Temple University and then subsequently uh, did his cardiac, cardiothoracic training at the University of Minnesota where we, uh, as you know, are a training site for them and had the pleasure of <clears throat> operating with him and seeing him and working with him. And he, he was clearly a standout. Uh, I've, I've been training residents for 20 some years and as also as a program director. And, and in my, my time as a, as a uh, trainer, as a trainer uh, there are just a handful of people that I would say have the quality, the patient engagement, patient ownership, and uh, technical uh, abilities that, uh, that Carol has. In fact, the only one that I would really, of the, of the trainees that I've had the pleasure of training, who I think is still has, has him, uh, is a lady by the name of Jennifer Lawton, who is now the chair of cardiac surgery at Hopkins. But uh, aside from her, Carol, <laughs> Carol did. And you know, one of the things I also, for those of you who are at the, the, the gala this, this weekend, we kind of have a new nickname for him. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's Bam. Not, not because of Bam Bam, like you know, the Flintstones but it's uh, for badass Moody <laughs> from our, our, our MC. But Carol, uh, Carol is, has been uh, a welcome and an important uh, long-term addition to our, our staff. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, as we get older, we're concerned about you know, the trainees as they're coming through because of work hours and whatnot, and are they gonna be the kind of person that you'd want to take care of me when I'm old and decrepit and need, need surgery and, no. and, and I'm... <laughs> And I'm happy that Carol is with us because uh, uh, he's the kind of person I want taking care of me when, when, uh, when, when I need it. So, Carol. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sam, for your kind words. Um, uh, I would like to start with uh, a, a little bit of uh, a, a with, uh, with few words about our new uh, trial that we are starting uh, uh, at uh, Abbott Northwestern. It's called the uh, Expand Heart Trial. It is a, uh, a pivotal prospective single arm trial. Uh, there will be 20 centers participating in this trial. Uh, it is for effectiveness and safety of OCS, which is uh, o uh, organ care system. It's a, a portable system for uh, warm preservation of the organs. It is already uh, used uh, for lungs, and uh, there is a platform also for liver and kidneys. Uh, it is um, it has uh, its CE mark in Europe. Uh, it, there will be uh, 55 uh, patients. Potentially uh, later there will be more enrolled in this trial. Uh, it is to uh, evaluate the uh, effectiveness and safety of this device. Um, the idea is to increase potentially the donor pool uh, of the extended criteria uh, donors uh, which uh, don't meet the typical criteria for cold or ice preservation. Uh, so with this, um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to uh, accept the hearts that come from further away than uh, uh, predicted uh, cold ischemic time over four hours, which is usually a cutoff point uh, for us nowadays, and also uh, donors that uh, have uh, as, uh, that are suboptimal in terms of uh, in terms of age, in terms of uh, some mild coronary uh, artery disease identified on the angiogram, and uh, uh, patients that we potentially don't know enough, or donor center doesn't want to. Uh, doesn't want to perform studies that we sometimes uh, ask for, like, for example, coronary angiogram. Um, this is the device that where the heart will be uh, placed and uh, perfused with the pulsatile uh, uh, ventricular assist device, and uh, it, there, it has a built-in 
um, uh, ventilator. So it's basically cardiopulmonary bypass. It's fully portable. Uh, it can travel uh, in the car. It can travel on the plane. Uh, um, I've actually participated in two uh, trials for lungs at the University of Minnesota. It's a lot of fun. Uh, very time consuming, obviously, for, uh, uh, for the center, but we are excited to have it here. And uh, uh, I think we are ready to start. We're going to Boston uh, in two weeks to, uh, for the uh, kind of technical aspect uh, uh, training, and uh, we'll start uh, soon. Uh, in terms of the recipient criteria, basically everybody that is on our uh, transplant, li uh, transplant list and uh, is willing to participate in the trial will be eligible uh, to, um, uh, to be part of it. Uh, so, uh, I think at this point everybody knows me. My name is Karl Muri. I'm one of the heart surgeons here. Uh, initially, I thought about uh, uh, talking about postcardiotomy, uh, postcardiotomy uh, shock syndrome, and utilization of mechanical circulatory support in those patients, but I figured that with few recent uh, cases that we encountered, uh, uh, we will be able to go uh, through different uh, modalities of mechanical circulatory support, different indications, and clinical scenarios. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so the first case, um, uh, first case is a 47-year-old female uh, with a past medical history of ulcerative colitis on chronic immunosuppression, uh, remote history of tobacco use and polysubstance abuse, according to her husband. Uh, she was clear for uh, years before presented. Uh, she came to outside hospital with upper respiratory syndromes, um, uh, cough, sinus congestion for about a week. She was placed on back treatment and sent home. Unfortunately, didn't improve, started to develop progressive chest uh, discomfort and pressure. On the day of uh, admission to an outside hospital, she developed acute onset of nausea and vomiting, followed by severe pain in the neck and between her shoulders, uh, between her shoulder blades that uh, radiated also to her jaw. She was brought by her husband to a local uh, emergency department. She was hypotensive, started immediately on neosinephrine infusion, and she was transferred uh, to Abbott. On arrival here, she was minimally responsive. She was obtunded, had diffuse skin modeling and poor peripheral pulses. She was hypotensive with mean arterial pressures in low 50s, heart rate at 140. She was immediately intubated and uh, the doses of inotropes and uh, vasopressors were uh, escalating. So uh, after getting a chest x-ray, we were kind of surprised to see pretty normal looking uh, lungs and uh, normal size heart with uh, not much congestion. Uh, labs showed uh, elevated white count to 17,000 hemoglobin of 10. Platelets were lower at 80. Uh, she was anuric at this point with creatinine at 3.3 and she was in uh, profound metabolic acidosis with lactate of 12. So uh, we started thinking, is she septic? Uh, is it aortic dissection with the um, pain radiating to the back or potentially she has an MI? So uh, obviously uh, in the back of our minds, we already were thinking uh, uh, ECMO activation. Uh, in the meantime, we um, uh, obtained EKG that showed uh, sinus tachycardia and no ST changes. Uh, CDA from the outside hospital after review uh, uh, showed no uh, dissection of the aorta and her uh, 3D uh, echo looked like this that we obtained at the bedside. What do you guys think? So uh, we made an intelligent decision that she is in cardiogenic shock as the LV is really not working. Uh, so um, uh, she went uh, immediately to uh, CAT lab for uh, peripheral VA ECMO placement and intraaortic uh, balloon pump placement that was performed without complications. She was a pretty small lady, so we used 15 French uh, uh, arterial cannula, which is kind of a standard of care for us unless patient uh, is of a, a larger body habitus. Uh, the subsequently performed coronary angiogram was normal, showed no coronary disease. Uh, however, in the meantime, we noticed that her regional SAT on both lower extremities uh, are uh, very low, uh, and she has basically no doppler pulses on bilateral lower extremities, on the side of um, uh, arterial cannula uh, from the VA ECMO and the intraaortic balloon pump uh, insertion sheet. So what would we do at this point? So uh, we decided uh, that uh, we need to uh, put peripheral uh, perfusion catheters 
uh, since uh, her lower extremities are at risk. And because of uh, really uh, small size, uh, 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 small size vessels, we asked vascular surgery to help us with placing uh, perfusion, distal perfusion catheters in her um, uh, superficial femoral artery uh, because uh, on, on all those pressures that she presented, uh, her, the size of, uh, uh, of her SFAs was uh, really small. Um, she, uh, that was suc uh, successfully done and uh, the uh, regional SATs in her lower extremities immediately uh, improved. Uh, so we were kind of wondering what the uh, etiology of uh, her cardiomyopathy uh, was uh, since we knew that she had no uh, coronary artery disease, no valve issue, she has uh, no dissection, and we really didn't know where would, the, uh, uh, where would it come from. Uh, so uh, at this point, with the negative history at that moment uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, drug abuse, uh, we made a diagnosis of uh, septic cardiomyopathy. So I'm just going to let this uh, uh, slide sit there for a moment as I don't feel competent to really go through uh, those details. And uh, uh, for me, the important thing is that it does exist, septic cardiomyopathy. And what is important clinically, that is actually uh, usually uh, fully reversible in terms of the myocardial recovery as long as uh, a patient actually survives and is uh, appropriately supported. Uh, what is interesting clinically is that uh, uh, as opposed to typical uh, uh, cardiogenic shock, the LV filling pressures are either normal or low, and that actually explains why her, why her chest X-ray uh, looked normal and uh, didn't show uh, congestion. It usually affects both sides of the heart, so there is uh, RV dysfunction uh, is pretty common. And uh, the survival of the patient, uh, even though it's thought to be lower, is not really related to uh, the heart damage. Uh, it's usually related to uh, sepsis and complication of sepsis itself. So as long as we are able to support the patient, uh, the heart usually uh, recovers. So after uh, placing her on ECMO with distal perfusion catheter, she was placed, uh, she was transferred to uh, ICU. Uh, she was pretty stable and the pressures were being weaned. Uh, this is her. Uh, this is the screenshot of her uh, uh, EKG monitoring. As you can see, she is in a nice sinus rhythm, probably sinus tachycardia. She has nice uh, waveform on the PA catheter. CVP. You cannot see the number, but it was around 14-15. And mean arterial pressure uh, at 80. Balloon pump is paused. Uh, anything concerning? Yes, sir. No post. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, obviously, at this point, we, uh, we know that this is a concerning part, um, and uh, uh, there is a concern for LV distension and LV stasis. So uh, uh, what we decided to do at this point uh, uh, is, to, uh, uh, is to unload and uh, drain her heart better. Uh, there are different ways of uh, uh, unloading the LV or uh, uh, LV decompression. Uh, this is a very neat paper. Uh, uh, from the European Journal of Heart Failure uh, that was uh, written by Dr. Miani and Dr. LaRusso. Uh, and uh, it shows, uh, it is a um, meta-analysis of uh, 207 articles of different uh, modalities of LV unloading. Uh, as you can see, they, uh, they identified uh, patients be, uh, operated on between 1993 and 2016 placed on ECMO. And there are different ways of, uh, uh, of LV unloading. You can, uh, it, can be done, uh, it can be done either directly through the left atrium, uh, directly through the left ventricle, uh, pulmonary artery. It can be done percutaneously uh, or surgically. Uh, uh, quite common uh, is, un uh, is unloading with intraaortic balloon pump, which uh, until recently we used it very broadly and still use from time to time. Uh, surgical uh, decompression of LV was only in 16% of patients out of this whole cohort. Uh, sternotomy was performed in 70% of those patients, and minimal invasive approach was used in 29% of patients. So uh, based on that, uh, the, question is, uh, uh, the question is why, uh, why, uh, uh, why do we have to really do it? So, uh, the, the, theory, uh, the theory behind the need for uh, unloading the left ventricle is that uh, it causes stasis in the left, uh, uh, left side of the heart, uh, lungs, and uh, a patient is at risk of 
thrombosing the heart and, uh, uh, and pulmonary vessels. Also, it increases the wall stress uh, of the myocardium uh, and the coronary perfusion is poor because of the stretching of the left ventricle. So the potential for recovery of the V is really low. Those patients, according to uh, current, uh, current literature, have mortality of over 90% that have uh, either ne uh, non or, uh, no or very low uh, LV uh, ejection. So because uh, intraaortic balloon pump is so broadly used and uh, uh, we've been using it uh, until recently also uh, quite commonly, uh, I, uh, you know, the question is, does it really work with the heart that is not contracting? And uh, uh, this is uh, the largest uh, series of patients that were actually analyzed uh, from, by our colleagues from uh, University of Taiwan uh, uh, of uh, patients placed on uh, ECMO support for cardiogenic shock. It's a cohort of over 500 patients uh, that were treated either with ECMO alone, 227 patients versus 302 patients with combined intraaortic balloon pump and uh, ECMO. And what they found that at two weeks, there was no difference in mortality uh, uh, even, after, uh, uh, even after adjustment for uh, potential differences between the groups uh, and uh, confounders. So uh, to date, uh, this is the really largest series analyzing uh, this problem, even obviously it is a retrospective review, uh, it, uh, it gives us uh, some idea about this modality for LV unloading. Were, were those patients um, uh, non hospital style or was it just the general use? Those are the, those were the, this was the general, that was the general, general this was the all cohort, uh, the all cohort pa uh, patients. So getting back to our case, she went to uh, the operating room for the LV vent placement. This is the modali modality that we, uh, we elected to uh, apply in those patients that have, uh, that have no meaningful ejection. And uh, we do it through a minimally invasive approach through uh, anterolateral left uh, uh, mini thoracotomy. Uh, we select the intercostal space based on the uh, computed tomography and where the apex of the heart is uh, positioned, it's usually fifth, sixth, or the seventh phase. Actually, it's usually lower than, uh, than we expect. Uh, incision is between six to seven centimeters. Uh, with the TEE uh, assistance, we are able to identify the dimple uh, on the heart, plus obviously palpation, to really, uh, to really find a good spot to uh, place the uh, venting cannula and to position it against uh, mitral valve. Uh, the cannula is usually large bore. It's 28 to 34 French right angle uh, cannula that is funneled two intercostal spaces below. It has a little uh, bumper to uh, prevent uh, uh, the cannula sliding uh, deeper into the left ventricle. Uh, large pledgeted sutures are uh, placed uh, around the apex and then after uh, placing a stab incision with knife uh, onto the uh, apex, the cannula is inserted, flushed, de aired clamped, secured at the skin level so the whole system is very stable. As you can see, the, uh, the tourniquets are cinched down, so this really doesn't travel. Hemostasis is a key because this patient is immediately placed on uh, anticoagulation, and uh, then this cannula is connected to the venous drainage from the right side of the heart, either percutaneously through the groin or directly through the right uh, atrium, and this way the heart is uh, decompressed from both sides. Uh, a patient came back to the unit uh, uh, with uh, this setup. Uh, she tested positive for influenza type B. Uh, top screen show, uh, showed that she was positive for methamphetamine. This was a screening test. Uh, however, a few days later, the confirmatory test showed that actually this was negative and the uh, uh, septic uh, cardiomyopathy uh, seemed to be uh, the right diagnosis for her. Uh, she was, uh, she uh, remained anuric uh, because of her cardiogenic shock probably. Uh, she was immediately started on CRT through her uh, VA circuit. And what we noticed that her uh, CKs over next, uh, of the, over following few days started rising significantly. And uh, six days after admission, there were 105,000. Uh, so uh, this was really astounding for us. And uh, this probably contributed to her uh, acute renal failure on top of the, uh, on top of the um, uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, we also thought that uh, uh, influenza, her, her flu uh, probably was uh, 
a cause of her initially uh, initial presenting symptoms with uh, severe muscle muscle pains in her chest and this pain uh, radiating to uh, between her shoulder blades. Um, we also found in the literature that actually influenza type B can uh, uh, sometimes cause uh, myocardial uh, myocardial damage on top of the uh, skeletal muscle damage, and uh, this was uh, most likely a reason of her uh, cardiomyopathy on top of the uh, uh, on top of the septic uh, uh, septic uh, etiology. Uh, so uh, over the following few days, she remained very stable. Pressures were weaned. She woke up and followed commands. Uh, since uh, we thought this is either septic or toxic, we tried to wean her off ECMO a few times, hoping we could decannulate her, but they were uh, uh, unsuccessful. Uh, the biopsy uh, from, of the heart uh, in the meantime showed uh, normal myocardium, no my ischemic damage or no fibrosis, so uh, potentially recoverable heart. So uh, what would you guys do? Would you continue? Would you uh, do something else like an LVAT with Joe Care? Uh, of course, we continue. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, the question is wh whether whether this was a good moment to to go for an LVAT in this patient. Uh, so, because uh, patient clearly is very sick uh, with uh, uh, dual organ uh, damage, heart and kidneys. Uh, so, are we going really for a Hail Mary operation, or is it a meaningful uh, potential recovery? Uh, so, as you can see, this is our uh, data from uh, last year at ISHLT. This is our uh, uh, all-commerce uh, LVAT uh, implant uh, survival at 12 months at 81%. ECMO to LVAT, we have actually quite large population. One of the biggest in the country is 75%, so very similar at 12 months. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's something to be proud of or not that we have so many ECMO to LVAT patients, but we have experience with it. Uh, this was a 24 patients at that time. We accrued, I think, another three or four since then. Uh, so uh, we decided to go with the uh, hardware uh, HVAT uh, because it's a relatively small pump. Her heart was normal size. LV was not dilated. Uh, this is the configuration how the LVAT is usually connected to the heart and aorta. Uh, we were hoping the uh, RV would do well and she would be able to be weaned of right ventricular support. Unfortunately, the uh, uh, reality proved otherwise. So as you can see, she required an LVAT. This is the outflow cannula to the ascending aorta. And because of the poor RV performance at the completion of the case, uh, she went on the uh, RVAT support. This was configured in a way uh, with the uh, graft sewn to the main pulmonary artery. This is the head of the patient here. This was tunneled through the epigastric area so we could uh, expand the RVAT without uh, reopening the chest. She did well after the surgery. Uh, the pressors were weaned, and post-op day 10, after this operation, she was ready to have her uh, right ventricular device uh, uh, explanted. So uh, this is how uh, this was done. Uh, uh, we did it in the operating room. Nowadays, we do it actually uh, with the wake patients in the ICU. Um, so this is the uh, PA graft that goes all the way to the main pulmonary artery and is tunneled in the epigastric area. Uh, patient's legs are here and head is here. Uh, so it's done with the local anesthetic, patients awake. Uh, this is all draped in sterile fashion. Uh, the skin and subcutaneous tissue is cut down all the way down to the fascia. The graft is exposed. The cannula obviously is divided already. Pump is stopped. Uh, then uh, using endo-GIA vascular stapler, uh, the graft is divided. It's uh, then put under the fascia. Fascia is closed to prevent infection of the graft because it uh, stays inside the body. It thromboses all the way to the PA and uh, just basically heals into the heart and the mediastinum, and then the skin is closed and patient does not need um, another uh, sternotomy, another chest uh, opening. So she did fine on her heart support. Kidneys recovered fully. She started rehabbing. The tracheostomy that she underwent was decannulated, and uh, follow-up echoes uh, looks like that. So, uh, uh, okay, so the question, what do we do? And she's only eight weeks out. Um, will you guys take it out? Yeah. Yeah. So I said no. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and why did I say it? Because I was afraid, right? <laughs> so uh, what I was afraid was the, the really the morbidity of early sternotomy and uh, 
uh, I know Dr. Sun is not afraid of it, but I, I am. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is really, it, it can be a very bloody, very difficult case. And uh, even though her LV actually recovered completely, she still had some mild RV dysfunction. Uh, with the cases like that can be really, uh, can be really difficult and require a lot of transfusion. And, uh, uh, you know, a large amount of uh, volume can put those patients, tip them over towards uh, full RV dysfunction, and then she could basically end up at the same uh, spot where she was uh, preoperatively. So I said, how about we just keep her on Kumar and send her home, and she can return in two, three months, and I will take the uh, LVAT out. However, before leaving the hospital, uh, she developed acute onset of slurred speech. Her um, uh, NI, uh, NIH uh, stroke score uh, was 8, which means she had at least moderate um, uh, neuro dysfunction with some hem neglect and was uh, uh, immediately uh, taken after the show code was called to CTA. And uh, we identified the uh, thrombus in uh, the M3, um, uh, in the M3 uh, segment of her right uh, middle cer cerebral artery. So our IR colleagues took her right away to a, a cat lab and uh, retrieved the thrombus uh, from the artery, and she had literally immediate recovery from uh, her stroke. So at this point, uh, my heart failure colleagues obviously started twisting my arms more that this LVAT should come out. So uh, I still was very afraid to take it out. So I started uh, uh, searching and uh, uh, proposed a, a technique that is uh, now described, even though the number of patients that have it done uh, is pretty low. Uh, it's called the commissioning of the uh, LVAD, uh, which basically um, uh, is done by dividing the outflow graph to the aorta with minimal invasive approach and uh, cutting out the driveline from, from subcutaneous tissue and letting the elvat thrombos, which happens usually within minutes, and then the inflow cannula in the left ventricle basically just endothelializes and, uh, uh, and the patient is kept on uh, uh, Coumadin for three to six months, and later on it can be taken out or just stay there and uh, live there. However, she developed uh, another symptom two days later which was uh, one a day before the scheduled surgery, and then I had absolutely no choice, but I needed to take her, out, take her, take her to OR uh, for full sternotomy. I removed uh, the ELVAD, and actually she did very well uh, without major complication, was discharged home, uh, and uh, she's doing fine. Uh, uh, we were not sure what to, uh, uh, what to do. Uh, in terms of uh, protection from possible uh, VT, VFIP in the future because of the left ventricular scar uh, from the LVAT cannula. This was patched with bovine pericardium. Uh, we spoke with uh, our EP colleagues, Dr. Gorning, and uh, decided uh, uh, to place the ICD, which was successfully uh, done, and she is uh, currently at home. And uh, this is uh, what I call Mrs. Case Number One Circle of Life. So uh, I like this case because she basically went through the whole uh, uh, possible modalities that we have. She didn't get a total artificial heart yet. Um, uh, so presented uh, uh, with cardiogenic shock, got ECMO, uh, went for the uh, full decompression of the heart, was converted to more durable solution, uh, then RV recovered, that was explanted, and then LV recovered, and uh, the LVAT came out, and she uh, returned to her normal life. Obviously, in the meantime, uh, her uh, she was in respiratory and renal failure, as many of those patients are, but her recovery is literally 100%. Uh, so uh, that will take us to case number two. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a case of a 51-year-old 50, male that was uh, transferred to us from the outside hospital, where, she, where he presented with uh, a questionable ST elevation MI with subtotal occlusion of the left main. Uh, when he was brought to the a cath lab uh, at outside hospital. He arrested with PA uh, in uh, in PA uh, rhythm. Uh, his uh, uh, the CPR was performed with the return of spontaneous circulation. His EF was only 10% of the LV gram performed with heart with very high filling pressure uh, pressures, and uh, he underwent emergent um, uh, stent of the left main and the circ. And despite that, uh, he was in profound cardiogenic. Uh, shock, and uh, this was the uh, LV gram that was um, performed there. So as you can see, his LV was not uh, performing well. For that purpose, uh, for that reason, he was uh, taken to the OR 
uh, at the outside hospital and had uh, cabbage tanks too emergently performed. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, upon winning, upon attempt of winning from cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, this was unsuccessful. He was diagnosed with postcardiotomy shock uh, syndrome, placed on peripheral VA ECMO, and transferred to us uh, the same day. Uh, when he arrived, uh, uh, when he arrived to Abbott, he had very poor peripheral perfusion and basically no ejection after we paused the balloon pump that was on the other side. Uh, in the groin, the other side of the ECMO insertion. So what do we do? Uh, we do the same thing every time. So uh, we took him to cat lab for distal peripheral uh, uh, catheter insertion and uh, uh, potentially a drainage of the left ventricle to follow after the cannulas would be in. We would take him to the uh, operating room. However, uh, after uh, the contrast was injected. Uh, we noticed that it's really no flow distally, which was kind of expected because uh, uh, the symptoms uh, uh, were uh, uh, were showing this. Uh, but uh, he also had a very similar finding on the other side, uh, where the balloon pump was. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we also noticed that uh, on his aortogram there was pretty significant. Um, a contrast deficit in the descending aorta. So we uh, we thought or we were concerned that there is either very large clot burden or plaque or this patient has type B aortic dissection uh, because there's clearly something uh, intraluminal. Uh, so with all those uh, uh, problems, we looked back at the CTA that was performed before patient was transferred the descending aorta seemed normal, and there was no flap that we could really identify. This is just one cut from the CAT scan, but really there was no intraluminal uh, contrast um, deficit. So uh, we kind of uh, wondered whether we should proceed with the distal perfusion cannulas, but he, uh, regardless of that, would need um, a surgical decompression of the left ventricle. So with this concern of potential type B aortic dissection, uh, we took him to OR for uh, conversion to central ECMO to promote the antegrade flow in the aorta and hopefully this way uh, correct for uh, possible iatrogenic uh, dissection. Uh, uh, upon reopening of his uh, previous sternotomy, uh, uh, he was centrally cannulated. Um, the, uh, uh, we placed a left ventricular uh, apical vent um, uh, per our standard uh, protocol at this point. Uh, and his ascending aorta uh, seemed normal. There was no intramural hematoma. There was no, um, uh, there was no dilation, uh, nothing that would suggest a dissection. Uh, however, uh, when I placed uh, a partially occlusive clamp uh, on the ascending aorta and made an incision, it turned out that there was a flap inside the ascending aorta. So uh, at this point, uh, the diagnosis was changed to type A dissection. Um, uh, so the decision was made to uh, perform the surgery that was required for uh, that specific, uh, that specific uh, condition, uh, which would be the ascending aortic replacement with hemiarch under uh, deep uh, circulatory arrest. So the patient was cooled down to 18 degrees of centigrade, uh, and uh, uh, we removed uh, the whole ascending aorta from the innominate uh, to the ST junction. The valve and the root were normal. There were no pairs in the ascending aorta, which uh, uh, basically uh, uh, made us think that this was a propagated type B retrograde, potential, potentially iatrogenic, or something that happened and was just propagated with the retrograde ECMO flow from the peripheral uh, insertion of the cannula. Uh, so uh, what this patient ended up with was replace ascending aorta, uh, LV vent through the, L, uh, through the LV apex, right atrial cannula for the uh, ECMO drainage, and return cannula from the ECMO to the ascending uh, aorta. Uh, uh, we kept the patient uh, with an open chest uh, for severe coagulopathy. Modified back dressing was placed, and patient was hemodynamically stable and returned to ICU. Uh, we were very, um, very um, proud and high-fiving each other and stuff. Uh, uh, we uh, always place uh, a, a flow probe on the LV vent uh, tubing because it shows us how well the uh, heart is drained or what's the flow uh, through the left ventricle. 
And uh, we did so uh, at the, on arrival to ICU, and we noticed that uh, the LD vent uh, uh, drainage uh, has very, uh, very poor flow, something between two to 500 cc's per minute. And normally we see sometimes two to three liters per minute. Um, so uh, we were not really sure what is happening because intraoperatively uh, with full anticoagulation, we had very good uh, flush from the cannula, uh, LV seemed well decompressed and the placement seemed uh, fine. Uh, but uh, we noticed that uh, there was very little or basically no pulsatility on the Swangans catheter that per chest X-ray was in the correct position. So we concluded that this patient uh, basically had no RV function and then looking back, I realized, well, duh, when I opened the chest, there was really no contractility on the right side of the heart. So basically this patient uh, had no flow through his lungs and the concern was with, the, with this amount of flow through the left ventricle and uh, uh, pulmonary vasculature, this uh, uh, cannula will not last and the patient is at very high risk of thrombosing the left ventricle and the lungs um, and uh, uh, obviously that uh, his mortality would immediately uh, go up. So uh, for that reason, he immediately returned to the OR uh, and uh, uh, we reconfigured his, uh, uh, his uh, mechanical support to biventricular uh, in order to uh, uh, promote the flow through the lungs. So we uh, already had three uh, needed cannulas, just added one to the main PA, and uh, the LV apex vent uh, served as a temporary LVAT inflow cannula. Inflow cannula. The sending aorta out uh, return cannula for the LVAT already was there. A right atrial drainage was there. We uh, included oxygenator, obviously, in the right-sided circuit to uh, make sure that the patient is properly oxygenated, and the cannula was inserted to the, uh, uh, R, uh, to the RV outflow um, uh, and uh, uh, advanced to the main PA. Uh, this way, uh, uh, we achieved uh, this uh, configuration with the LVAT inflow through the apex, uh, return to the ascending aorta. We cannot see it here because it's not radio-opaque, it's just a, a Gore-Tex graft. Then the drainage for the RVAT from the right atrium and the return to the main PA um, uh, via uh, RV outflow tract. Uh, patient uh, returned to ICU with good flows through both circuits, and his chest was closed uh, day three uh, with this uh, uh, configuration in place. Uh, in the meantime, we noticed that he wasn't waking up well uh, day one and day two, so we performed a CT uh, of his head, and uh, it showed uh, left ischemic uh, stroke. Um, so uh, obviously we consulted uh, neurology uh, for that purpose. Uh, based on the opinion, uh, this may have happened before the patient arrived to Abbott, but we really don't know. So um, what would we do at this point? Dr. Miranda, would you continue? Yes. <laughs> because it's my patient, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the were, we had a lot of discussion, obviously. Is this, um, uh, are we reaching futility? Is this patient potentially survivable? And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we really talked to, about those patients a lot. And uh, we decided that, uh, you know, with this configuration of mechanical support, uh, the patient is basically uh, set up for potentially even a few weeks. So there was really nothing that would rush us. And, uh, his end organs, other than kidneys, started recovering. He was uh, metabolic, metabolically stable. Uh, so the decision was made to basically let him wake up and see what he does, uh, and that was done. So we continued the care. He was extubated actually three days after this, um, uh, this whole uh, uh, surgery we did, and um, uh, he was awake. He had uh, uh, sensory aphasia, uh, as expected, uh, with uh, right uh, hemiparesis. But, uh, he seemed, uh, he seemed like someone that, uh, that uh, you potentially would not, uh, uh, would not uh, discontinue care on. Uh, fast forward four weeks, uh, this patient actually is uh, rehabbing quite well. He started making some urine, it's still uh, hemodialysis dependent. Uh, but uh, neurologically, uh, this is the note from our, uh, from our colleagues, uh, he's actually making quite a bit of progress and is, uh, has already made progress. Uh, his language and functional abilities are improving. Uh, uh, the 
concern is that he is really uh, ICU bound and we are not able to rehab him more uh, uh, than uh, just getting him out of bed to chair and trying to stand him up uh, because of the um, uh, because of his uh, temporary mechanical support. So uh, um, at this point, we decided that uh, we gotta uh, convert him if we wanna continue to something more durable. Um, uh, the question is: Is this the right patient to do so? Uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, amongst, among each other, as you can imagine, and uh, with the family. The family is very supportive, um, and this patient is planned to uh, receive his HeartMate 3 uh, in two days. Um, uh, the RV support uh, is planned to be kept in place, uh, not because we think that the RV requires that, but this, because we think that the RV will be uh, worse perioperatively, so we basically uh, just plan to uh, avoid the peri perioperative RV failure and uh, uh, give him a, what we call a soft landing or smooth landing after the surgery. We'll just change the uh, ARVAD to our system where we don't need to reopen the chest and just uh, take the ARVAD at the bedside when he's ready to be completely weaned off uh, postoperatively. That's his current setup. As you can see, there's four tubings. Um, uh, this is the LVAD inflow. There is LVAD outflow. You cannot see the cannula going to the aorta. Uh, there is RVAD inflow and RVAD outflow. His lungs are fine. He is not oxygenated on the oxygenator anymore. It's out of the circuit. Uh, so we're hoping we can uh, continue. And uh, I will, guys, keep you posted uh, where we are with him. Um, so I just want to switch gears for a moment and uh, tell you about uh, a little bit about Intermax, which is the Interagency uh, inter Registry for Mechanically as Assisted Circulatory Support Patients. It's, a, it's an ongoing registry that was initiated uh, at University of Alabama uh, and it's uh, run by Dr. Kirkland. Um, it, it, uh, it collects the data uh, of uh, uh, patients with uh, durable mechanical uh, uh, circulatory support. Uh, mostly LVADs because that's the largest population. There is uh, currently close to 20,000 patients of those. Uh, we also obviously report uh, and put our data into this registry. Uh, uh, those patients, those, there are also patients on biventricular support and total artificial heart, but as you can imagine, uh, this is a, a minority of them. Intermax uh, profiling is uh, something that we use uh, for describing the end stage uh, heart failure as a prognostic tool. Uh, uh, perioperatively uh, when a patient uh, is uh, planned for uh, a durable, uh, in, um, durable mechanical circulatory support uh, implant. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, uh, this profiling goes from the sickest at one to the healthiest, quote unquote, patients at Intermax 7. Uh, we uh, all know those patients very well. Um, sometimes uh, I honestly look at this table um, all the time when I try to uh, uh, classify my patients. Uh, so those are the ones, Intermax 1, the crush and burn patients that basically uh, have to go immediately, emergently of mecha on mechanical circulatory support, usually either ECMO or biventricular temporary support. Intermax 2 and 3, we implant most of our LVADs in this, uh, within this spectrum, unfortunately still. Uh, Intermax 2 patients are the ones that are sliding on inotropes, are developing end organ failure, are on dual inotropes. Intermax 3, single inotrope, quote-unquote stable, usually uh, dependent, uh, uh, dependent on uh, a very close monitoring in ICU. Um, uh, Intermax 4 patients are the frequent flyers, are the ones that are not inotrope dependent as of yet, but um, uh, have uh, recent uh, uh, admissions for uh, heart failure. Uh, they basically cannot do uh, anything. They are symptomatic uh, sometimes uh, at, uh, 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 they're symptomatic on re uh, at rest. Intermax 5 are the patients that can only, that are sim uh, asymptomatic only at rest, uh, but with any uh, physical activity they become uh, symptomatic. And 6 and 7 patients are the uh, kind of a 3, uh, a three, three B patients uh, that can be uh, ambulatory. Um, so with this little intro, I'm just going to take you to uh, the last case, uh, which is a case of the 55-year-old male with known ischemic cardiomyopathy status post previous stenting in New York, uh, New York Heart Class 4. Uh, 
And this is the patient that is Intermax 4, uh, as opposed to two previous ones that are Intermax 1 or less, even though we don't have a class for ECMO patients. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a patient that has normal valves on uh, ECHO uh, with EF of uh, 20 to 25%. The unique feature of this patient is that this is the patient that I saw in the clinic as opposed to ICU, and I was actually able to have a conversation with the patient, not with the family. Uh, so uh, uh, that made me really uh, excited. Uh, and uh, long story short, this patient uh, was enrolled uh, to uh, our uh, Momentum 3 trial, uh, received, he, uh, received his uh, uh, ELVAT uh, HeartMate 3, uh, um, did uh, uh, quite well perioperatively, and this is the most uh, unique feature or most incredible uh, uh, characteristic of this patient, that this patient's whole hospital stay can be summarized on one slide and we're really not missing anything. And this is what I really like about him. So uh, as you can see, uh, as Dr. Zimba described, uh, this is the patient that uh, underwent a heart made 3 implant for ischemic cardiomyopathy, had some RV dysfunction, was supported with dobutamine temporarily, and this was weaned. He was admitted uh, on the 14th for his right heart cut. Four days later, after optimization, he got his heart made three and was discharged 10 days after the surgery um, and had no complications. So uh, this is the patient, this is the type of patient we want to see, obviously, uh, more. Uh, so uh, just getting back to um, the Intermax profiling and uh, risk stratification, uh, uh, Intermax uh, uh, profiles obviously are commonly used uh, at the time of the ELVAT implant uh, as, a, uh, as a prognostic factor whether uh, what, what we can expect perioperatively and postoperatively. Uh, however, uh, uh, this, was, this is not currently very commonly used for patients that are uh, at end-stage heart failure but are still treated uh, medically, and we have a fair amount of those patients in our clinical practice as we know. Uh, so this is a, a very nice paper from uh, last year. Uh, by Dr. Stewart, that was published in Circulation, and uh, it is a, a, it is a patient that is that uh, is uh, looking at uh, a, a cohort of 166 patients uh, with end-stage heart failure, uh, patients that are uh, with uh, advanced heart failure but are ambulatory and uh, stayed outside the hospital. Uh, it includes patients uh, from Intermax four to seven, so the non-inotrope dependent patients. Uh, those are the uh, characteristics, uh, the characteristics of uh, this cohort. Uh, as we can see, uh, Intermax 4 uh, is, uh, uh, for Intermax 4 we have 23% uh, uh, of patients and uh, uh, um, uh, Intermax 5, 32, and the remaining is the, pa uh, the uh, patients in Intermax 6 and 7. Uh, what is, uh, what is uh, interesting uh, in, this, uh, in this cohort that at one year, out of the whole group of patients, so also the, the ones that are uh, uh, New York Heart uh, 3A and 3B, only 47% of patients are uh, alive on, medical, uh, on optimal, optimal medical therapy. And this, is, uh, this was the study that was uh, uh, conducted in 10 centers around the country that also offer mechanical circulatory support and transplantation. So those are all, all uh, tertiary and coronary centers. All those patients were followed closely and uh, uh, were on optimal uh, medical uh, therapy uh, per current, uh, uh, current ACC guidelines. Uh, so looking at, the, uh, uh, looking at the survival of the, co all, uh, the whole cohort, as we can see, a life on medical therapy uh, uh, is only 47% of patients. 15% uh, of those were uh, implanted with, uh, 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 with uh, mechanical support, 15 were transplanted, and uh, a fifth uh, of this uh, population uh, died at one year. In terms of the... Uh, uh, in terms of the overall uh, survival, uh, if, uh, overall survival from the from the initial uh, from the initial uh, initial strategy of optimal uh, optimal medical management, at 12 months, only 6% of patients in Intermax 4 
So 60% of patients in Intermax 4 are alive on physical therapy that wouldn't require either transplant or um, LVAT implant. Uh, even more, uh, the mechanical, uh, the MCS free survival uh, at 12 months on optimal medical management is only uh, uh, 39. Uh, percent of patients. So def, uh, Intermax 4 patients are the ones that we really uh, that we really are trying to uh, target of uh, target uh, in terms of uh, capturing early and bringing to appropriate advanced therapy. Um, the authors concluded that uh, uh, the patients uh, the patients uh, with end stage heart failure, even uh, uh, even uh, ambulatory patients, um, with at least uh, one uh, recent admission uh, for heart failure uh, are at high risk of either dying or requiring advanced therapy. So, uh, which means that those are the patients that have to be really uh, followed very closely and uh, brought to our attention uh, uh, so we can identify the moment for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, implantation of with the LVAT or directing towards uh, uh, transplantation. And uh, Intermax 4 patients are the ones that really uh, will benefit uh, uh, with mechanical circulatory support in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, survival. So in summary, there is a, a variety of uh, MCS modalities and techniques. Uh, there is no one uh, device that uh, uh, not one modality that fits uh, um, all the patients. Uh, identifying the patients in, uh, uh, with in end stage heart failure and uh, with high risk features like recent uh, admissions for heart failure uh, in low intermax profile uh, will uh, help identify the moment of the uh, implantation or advanced therapies and will improve survival. Um, thank you very much. That's all, and uh, I will be happy to uh, take questions. I would like to thank all the heart failure team. Obviously, this is, uh, as you can see, big uh, uh, teamwork. And uh, without everyone present here, obviously, we couldn't uh, uh, we couldn't uh, do it. Carl, thanks. That was awesome. Um, does for Intermax Sports, are you required to have a hospitalization for heart failure in the last year, or did they just add that to make it more discriminating? In this, uh, this was the cohort of the patients that had one, uh, one recent hospitalization for heart failure. So at least one within 12 months specifically for that purpose. This was, this was one of the incl inclusion factors. So they're really even maybe sicker than four. I mean, if you... I mean, it seems like a hospitalization, because a lot of our stem cell trials require that hospitalization in the last year would sort of up the ante a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, uh, we, we don't exactly, you know, some of those patients, when they come to hospital, they, uh, uh, the, the Intermax 4 profile is basically the inotrope non-dependent patient. But we really don't know whether those patients were admitted at, and were placed on inotropes uh, or not temporarily, and then they uh, were uh, upgraded to higher uh, Intermax profile because they improved. This is the data that we are kind of missing uh, in this study. Uh, so as you said, those are patients that potentially can be sicker, uh, but those are the patients that are very, very difficult to kind of delineate, and they very easily jump from one uh, risk profile, one group to another. Okay. So, to answer your question on this particular paper, those 156 patients should be included in this particular study. They had an admission for heart failure as a trigger point for it. Then they went down and they stratified them based on the Aramax score after they've already captured them as an admission. So if you just take it all covered, who may not have had a hospital admission for heart failure in the last year, and you stratify them out, you may get slightly different numbers. So just, I think that's what you were asking. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that we put, we put too much focus on the hospitalization. We should be cognizant of the fact that hospitalization is a little subjective. 
sometimes it depends on your sphincter tone and also on what resources you have. I mean, in the heart failure uh, clinic, we can adjust uh, diuretics, et cetera, keep people on a short leash and see them often. So I think to, resolve, uh, to, to just focus on hospitalization misses a large cohort of patients that perhaps are better served by this uh, treatment. Yeah, we had uh, a lot of discussions about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the need for admission and really uh, intermax profiling because uh, when do we decide patient needs to go on inotropes? Well, let's say patient is on optimal medical oral therapy uh, and uh, sees us in the clinic and we say, hey, how are you doing? Well, I've, I've been doing fine. Uh, any changes? No, no changes. So we basically, okay, patient's doing fine. Uh, but we really, very often, uh, patients are so uh, so well adapted, as we all know, to, to the heart failure symptoms. They really don't identify the moment when they start sliding. That's why uh, that's why I think following at centers like ours uh, or you know overall tertiary centers is important, because uh, you know based on uh, the other study roadmap study, those patients can be followed very closely. But close follow up is really something. Um, of utmost importance, I would say, and sometimes close follow-up means we have to see them literally weekly. So the question is: Is it uh, is it better for those patients to be kept uh, to be seen weekly for a few months and then go on mechanical circulatory support, or is it is it a moment to have a discussion with the patient about quality of life and potential improvement, as is actually shown in many studies that that happens with the uh, with the after the Elvad implant and actually pull the trigger slightly earlier and give the patient uh, uh, the benefit of the improved quality of life and more functional, fun better functional status. Uh, Carl, on the uh, Intermax uh, uh, 4 mm -hmm. um, group of patients, has that been tested in a larger population of heart failure uh, patients? Because 164 patients is a, it's a very small number to make these very important decisions on, and uh, it would, it, you know, because once once that feels more robust, boy, then you can execute on it. Because there's there's a ton of those patients around, right? Um, so uh, no, I think this is the uh, you know the the largest population. This is the largest uh, specifically uh, population uh, in Intermax uh, in in those higher uh, in those higher Intermax uh, group that was treated. Uh, uh, um, that was uh, th 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 where the intention to treat was uh, optimal medical management. The, uh, when we look at the Intermax database, uh, the patients, uh, first of all, majority of those patients present to us late, and they are in advanced heart failure, and they are in low Intermax groups. Uh, Intermax was for many years used only as a, uh, as a risk stratification tool for the patients that are going on mechanical support. So this is really kind of the first time when we are looking, uh, when we are looking how they do on optimal medical management. Is it okay to continue or not? And uh, when, when is the trigger to pull it? The biggest, study that, uh, the biggest study that is trying to identify this moment is the roadmap study and then the roadmap tool, which is a two-year follow-up. This is a 200 patient. It's a, a prospective observational study it, uh, uh, that uh, enrolls patient uh, to either uh, optimal medical management arm or MCS arm in the higher intermax patients between four to seven. Uh, it is not a randomized trial. It is a, unfortunately a, a group. Uh, the assignment to the group was uh, based on uh, the clinical picture and the identific identification of sicker patients going into the mechanical support and healthier patients going to uh, uh, going to um, uh, optimal medical uh, management uh, arm. And what the trial basically showed is that uh, patients uh, patients have survival benefit in the arm in the mechanical circulatory support arm, but they pay a price for it with higher morbidity related to, uh, uh, related to uh, uh, implantation of the ELVA. This was, and this was based on a HeartMate 2 uh, uh, device. 
So this was the previous generation of the LVAD. Uh, however, when uh, the Intermax, uh, higher Intermax patients are on optimal medical management, and obviously because this was a, just a, a prospective observational study, it was a large crossover of the patients from the medical management to, uh, uh, to the mechanical circulatory support uh, 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 arm, there was actually no uh, mortality penalty for keeping the patients on medical management and pulling the trigger the moment when they take a dip and start sliding on, uh, they the start sliding and go and require inotropes. But the key thing is that in order to not have, uh, not to lose those patients, it's a very, very close follow-up. So this is really this is kind of the this is kind of the message from the roadmap uh, trial. So as long as those patients are followed very closely, they can uh, they can stay on medical therapy. But obviously, it doesn't take long when they advance to a lower class, and then they have to be implanted in order to avoid avoid higher mortality. So roadmap is the the only trial. Dr. Sani, I don't know if you have any anything to add to that. No, what you said was exactly right. These are two studies. One is Medimax, which is what's being presented here. Medimax is essentially looking at what happens if you stop in your medical management people, and and with without a without an arm, particularly of saying we're at, at the time of enrollment, we're going to uh, do X, something else. We're just going to manage these people medically and see what's happening. That's what was presented here. This is a ten center, you know, Lynn Water Stevenson's, you know, kind of paper. Um, and that's, that's the data you saw. Roadmap, on the other hand, is a slightly different. But we're looking at the same patient population, just a different treatment strategy. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Moody. Dr. Kelly, next. Thank you.